Bond story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. In this week's On Story, a conversation with Ray McKinnon, the creator of the Sundance Channel's breakout hit, Rectify. Though I wanted to be a writer before I became an actor, I've spent a large part of my career as an actor and writing in the closet. Because of uh, my acting training and because I like to perform, I, I definitely read aloud these characters and try to approach it like an actor approaches a character and just thinking of these characters as three-dimensional people, you know, and, and with all the complexities that three-dimensional people have. This episode, Ray McKinnon details how to capture the personality of a culture through establishing strong characters, tone, and atmosphere. I kind of wrote in the closet for uh, well over a decade and uh, and then I got into acting, which, you know, was uh, very difficult, too, but, but at least the words were written for you. And, uh, and it took a long time to, to figure out how to be competent in that field. Uh, you know, you, just like writing, you have to develop a craft, uh, or most of us do. And, uh, and so I was focused on that. But the whole time I had in the back of my mind that, I, you know, I would, con I would tell stories one day on film because it seemed like the perfect marriage. And, and so I continued to write. My relationship with the South is complicated. My relationship with my hometown is complicated. And, it's, and that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just complicated, you know. And, and part of the reason I think I write is because of those conflicts and complications of that relationship. I wrote a number of shorts and then finally I, I wrote The Accountant and that, that you know, we, we all decided that was the one that we should make. I'd seen an a old farmhouse when I was driving through Georgia and then this double wide trailer beside it, the farmhouse was abandoned and the, the trailer was occupied and I imagined that the family had moved out of that drafty old farmhouse into the double wide because it was, you could heat it. And that, that started the idea um, you know, I grew up in a rural area and, and where agriculture was a, and still is a big part of the community. And I, I think that's what I try to do with stories, whether it's consciously or not, is, is, is lots of things interest me. And then in fiction, you can, you can put them, you know, all together and tell a story. And, and, and in the case of the accountant, it was certainly more uh, uh, um, uh, dogmatic or, you know, he, he had a very strong point of view. This is Boston Market. You'll know soon enough. It's brilliant, actually. What is? They're playing. One world, one culture, one corporation, whatever you want to call it. First, they, they take away the little man's ability to produce his own food by devising a system where he's got access to easy credit with easy terms. Once they get him hooked, then they change the rules. Yeah, I thought, you know, if we can keep it contained and, and still be able to shoot, you know, have beautiful shots and, and make it both cinematic and, and, uh, and dialogue heavy. Uh, because, you know, people say it's a film, it's visual. I said, well, no, it's visual and sound. You know, so you can have movies that have dialogue. And with Rectify, I, I knew that I couldn't pitch that story. You know, so I just wrote the script. I, I knew that that, that pitch would, would not go down well and, and, and it would be very difficult to pitch the tone. And, and then the problem with the pitch is if somebody does like it, then what you write may not be close to what their imagination of, of the pitch was. So I, I just decided to write it. Scientific technology of DNA and how that's, uh, you know, opened up cases and, and, and uh, shown that definitively that there were people who they said did this and, and the DNA said it wasn't them. 
And there were a number of cases in Illinois uh, about a decade ago uh, that, that came into the national spotlight uh, um, where people were, had been on death row or life without parole for 20 to years on down. And, and you would see them have their, uh, you know, their press conference and they would, of course, the question, well, what are you going to do tonight? You know, I'm going to go have a beer and have a steak with my family or I don't know, I'm going to go watch a movie and and that was as deep as it got and what what sparked my imagination was like yeah but what will the next day be like you know what will it be like to be in a room that's not a cell when you wake up and you can actually open the door and go out the hall and out in the big wide world you know and 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 uh and i was curious and how surreal that must be what you know what kind of uh, acid trip that must be like So that was the genesis of it, and then I then I wanted to uh, tell a story about a, a guy who um, who was a different kind of cat before that, you know, and 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 I wanted to see what he would be like after that experience. Then, you know, watching prosecution in these cases that seemed to be so weighted towards that was bad prosecution and you should admit that, and they still won't admit it. And so there's a, there's a kind of group psychology that, that a lot of people on the prosecution side stick with, and they're gonna stay with that story no matter what, and they're gonna retry that person no matter what. And, and I was interested in exploring that psychology, and again, that psychology can't be explored in 90 minutes. Mistakes were made, CJ, no doubt about it. We've all made mistakes in our own individual lives things we regret do different. That's beside the point whether Holden is a killer, which I believe deep in my heart he is. I couldn't have lived with myself all these years otherwise. Could you? And I'll be damned if I'm gonna let him get away with it now just because we tried to protect an innocent girl's reputation. It's pretty much totally fictional. I mean, you know, the, the West Memphis Three case, uh, I purposefully didn't see any of the documentaries uh, and, and listen to as little about it as possible, because I was living in Arkansas at the time until after I wrote the, the first episode of Rectify. I just didn't want to be influenced by that story uh, for, in particular, uh, although there are some you know, comparisons because Daniel is a different kind of cat and Damien Eccles was a different kind of cat. But, but I didn't want, it's a fictional piece. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to do a, a biopic or, or something that was, I, I didn't want to be hemmed in by reality. <laughs> you know, I really, I mean, fix, part of what fiction allows us to, to do is tell stories in ways that you can't tell in nonfiction, you know, uh, and, and tonally, and it, it's just a different art form. And so I just, you know, I wanted to be, have the freedom to go where the imagination took me. Um, you know, I mean, as far as Daniel goes, it's like, what, what is prison? You know, in, in, on, on death row, he, it was like because he was so restricted and because his, he had so few options, it allowed him another kind of freedom to let his mind go wherever it wanted to. You know, it's a bit like being in, you know, in a very severe monastery where you didn't have all these outside influences and that allowed him to think in ways that, that 
oftentimes we can't think in, in, in our, you know, in the busy everyday world where there's all these things going around. And, and then when he's released, where he has all this freedom, by the third episode, he can't deal with that. It's just overload. You think you might be ready to go out in a little bit? I don't know. I, I think I might just lay low today. Oh. Uh, sure. I'm sorry. No, there's nothing to be sorry about. Each character is on their own existential journey. You know, they're every, we, like we all are continually trying to find and redefine our, our, the meaning of life and our meaning of life. And, and certainly Daniel is the, at the, for, the most pointed of this, of this uh, journey, but, but they all are. You know, and p part of what I'm doing, I think, subconsciously is, is you know, using them to, to find my own meaning in my life. You know, and I think that's probably what a lot of writers do. This, this story does have its share of comedy. We, we you know, they distilled this, uh, this trailer I think it would have been too confusing to try to tell a story in three minutes and have both the dramatic and comical elements in it. Uh, when you mix Daniel, who's you know this alien, with his stepbrother Ted Jr., who's this good old boy, you know it's just ripe for uh, miscommunication. And and born out of that miscommunication can be comedy and also uh, later on in the season tragedy. <laughs> People eat more than I recall. Yeah. You know, buffets used to just be for Sundays after church. Now it's seven days a week around here. Can't even really compete as a business model without one. <laughs> so, was the Ming Dynasty around before you went in? I'm sorry? Chinese buffet up on the interstate. No. Well, when it first opened, it was all you could eat for $3.99. You ever seen so many dumb Georgia crackers descending on egg rolls and sweet and sour chicken in all your life? That's interesting. Yeah, I guess. I was trying to represent a, a kind of realism that's different from, say, The Accountant or other shows that I've done. But and and in that realism, you have all of the above, just like you do in life. All of these people in Daniel's world that he comes back to uh, have expectations of who he is and what he should be. And, and they're all projecting onto him uh, these, their, their own, own interests. And, you know, he's just trying to get through the day. And, and even by not, by doing his best not to engage in the world, he still uh, causes problems just by being. And, you know, we, we discussed that, like uh, his sister, Amantha, who spent her, from, she was 12 when he was sent to prison. Now this is all backstory, but it's really important to talk about that if you're a writer. So she was 12, and when she she decided, you know what, I'm going to get my brother out of prison, and I'm going to dedicate everything I have. So by the time he gets out, and she's 30, uh, 32 maybe, she's spent most of her life trying to get her brother out of prison, and she is projected onto that event and onto him, all these expectations of what kind of brother he'll be when he gets out and what that, how that will fill her up. And he doesn't play the role correctly, and that upsets her. Daniel, Daniel, please. Please what? Please be the way you want me to be? No, I just want you to be happy. I will be happy. When I'm cleansed, I will be happy. Daniel, please. I don't know how you want me to be. But Daniel. I'm not even sure if I'm alive. Just stop. Stop living your life for me, Amantha. I never asked you to, ever. So I, I think it's really important to talk about it and then talk about the ramifications after his arrival and the complexities of that. And if, you know, if you're into that kind of storytelling, you know, which I am because of rule number one, right, what interests you? I like, I like stories wh where I'm being fed everything and and I'm like this, you know? I enjoy those stories from time to time, but I also enjoy stories where I'm actually uh, 
leaning in and observing what's going on and, and, and I'm more engaged in that way as a, and you know, there aren't a lot of those stories anymore. I think, I think uh, you know, the people in power are so afraid that, that somebody's gonna turn a channel or, you know, or that, that they, they want it to be fast, quick, now. It's like the rat hitting the, the button of cocaine in his little uh, cage. And, and it is a risk, you know? You don't know if a, a modern audience uh, has the kind of, you know, uh, concentration. It's, it's, you know, it's a, a little bit more like a novel. Uh, but that's what I, I like, and, and that's all I know to do. And, and uh, for some people, it will resonate. You've been watching A Conversation with Ray McKinnon on On Story. Next up, writer Graham Gordy and his short film, The Spinola Pepper Sauce Company. Hi, I'm Graham Gordy. I'm uh, the writer and actor in Spinola Pepper Sauce Company. The idea for the film came, I was driving through South Arkansas and North Louisiana, and I drove past, uh, there's a sign that said, Louisiana begins at Lake Providence. Right before that, on the road, you pass the actual Panola Pepper Sauce Company. Um, and so I just started into this thing of saying, uh, you know, they say Louisiana begins at Lake Providence, Louisiana, but I believe that Louisiana begins at Panola Pepper Sauce Company. And, um, and then, you know, it was a completely kind of de desolate area driving through Lake Providence. And then, you know, well, we look at the train, we go to Penske's Pecan Market. So I just started naming off all these things. And in that way that you do in a car when you're alone and going nuts. Working with Ray was great because, uh, I mean, as an actor, because he comes at it as an actor, always. He was great beforehand as we talked about it, as we sort of analyzed it, as we sort of figured out our own, you know, backstory for this guy and talked about, you know, these the, the motivations for all these things. Coming up is uh, my film, Spinola Pepper Sauce Company. I hope you enjoy it. Take it in, crown jewel of the south. Get out here and get you some of God's precious air. You know, people like to say that Louisiana begins at Lake Providence, Louisiana. But we like to say that Louisiana begins six miles north, Spanola Pepper Sauce Company. 67 acres, 19 different pepper varieties from anchos to poblanos to Pakistani reds. Come summer, this will all be pepper. Far as the eye can see. People ask me, what do you do for fun in Lake Providence? Well, on Sunday, for instance, we'll go pick up Mother, we'll go to church, we'll go to Penske's Pecan Market so she can make her almost world famous pecan pie. Go over to Mr. Richards and count the corn rows. The boys like to throw rocks at the old grain silo. Maybe go look at the old hand car. Sometimes we'll go to the seed warehouse. Just your average Sunday. Of course, we've had all kinds of privations, depredations, denigrations here at Spanola. There's a fire in a big barn back in 90. Then the big house burned in 93. Of course, I met Margaret in 97. I like fruit juices. Apple, orange, pineapple, a mixture thereof, as long as it's not too much pineapple. I don't drink beer. I think it tastes like something you feed a hog. If we leave the house on Sunday night, for instance, take mother home or what have you, we will on occasion encounter a vampire. We wrap ourselves in our garlic stuffed Kalamata olives for protection. Now, if we are forced to engage a vampire, the boys prefer to fling holy water on them while mother and I will simply drive a pepper steak into their hearts. 
barbecue sauces, honey mustards, injectable marinades, ready mixes, potato stick. You know, Margaret was just a terrific mother to the boys. She was just as kind and generous a soul as has ever walked God's green earth. I take the boys to the correctional facility sometimes so they can look at the inmates. I position them a safe distance from the razor wire fences so they can yell their taunts. <laughs> they think of the funniest doggone things to say. You know, my sister is the only one who still embraces religion, yet her husband came out to be a homosexual. What do you suppose that means? Sometimes I wonder if I should let my boys go on living in a world like this. You grow numb. I'll take a switchblade knife and I'll press it against my arm and I will open up the blade deep into my flesh just to feel something, anything at all. Maybe we ought to go look at the train again. A vampire cannot seduce a woman. He can only attack her. No one seduced Margaret. That is a fabrication invented by novelists and Hollywood types. It will be a great reckoning. The rivers will run with the red hot blood of the vampires. I tell the boys, if you see her, your mother is not your mother anymore. They understand. We'll do what we must to survive. Maybe we'll go back in there, sidle up to a big old piece of that pecan pie. Some meals you remember. It was a good day, though, today, wouldn't you say? Indeed. We ought to be fine out here till nightfall. With a vampire's kiss I got a vampire's heart Now I don't roll out of bed Till after dark See my teeth so sharp And my blood so still You know I could drink the world And never get my fill and when I come, I will come on like a dream With the crimson moon shining down upon my devil's ring You see, it ain't my fault that I am this way Just a crying in my box for I missed a day Lord, what I would give For just one drop of red Now the dew is on the grass And I am late for bed And when I come
With a crimson moon is shining down upon my devil's ring. For more On Story, check out our free podcast at onstory.tv or search the iTunes store. And get the book today, On Story, Screenwriters and Their Craft, on Amazon. Thank you.